Psalm 113 verses 1, 3 and 5 to 8. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes, with the princes of his people. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious Lord, we thank you for reminding us that we are called to praise your name, that we are created with this purpose of worshipping you in our lives. There is none like you, Lord. God who is seated and throned on high, and God at the same time who is with us. God who looks down compassionately on the lowly and the poor. Oh Lord, as we worship you together, that we, we pray that you enable us to see more of who you are and to worship you in spirit and in truth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We will now have the readings from the scripture. First, the Old Testament reading from Nehemiah chapter 5, followed by the epistle reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. The Old Testament reading is taken from Nehemiah chapter 5, verses 1 to 19. Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. Some were saying, We and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, our home to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying, We have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we are the same flesh and blood as our fellow Jews, and though our children are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. I told them, you are charging your own people interest. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as possible, we have brought back our fellow Jews who were sold in, uh, to the Gentiles. Now you are selling your own people only for them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet because they could not find nothing to stay. So I continued, what are you doing, what you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? And I, my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain. But let us stop charging interest. Give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves, house, and also the interest you are charging them. One percent of the money, grain, new wine, and olive oil. We will give it back, they said, and we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. Then I summoned the priests and made the nobles and officials take an oath to do what they had promised. I also shook out the folds of my robe and said, In this way may God shake out their house and possessions anyone who does not keep his promise. So many as such a person be shaken out and emptied. At this the whole assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. Moreover, 
from the 20th year of King Artus Ezex, when I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah until the 32nd year, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allotted to the governor. But the earlier governors, those preceding, preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to the food and wine. Their assistants also lorded it over the people. But out of the reverence for God, I did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to work on this wall. All my men were assembled there for the work. We did not acquire any land. Furthermore, 150 Jews and officials ate at my table, as well as those came to us from the surrounding nations. Each day, one ox, six choice sheep, and some poultry were prepared for me, and every ten days, an abundant supply of wine of all kinds. In spite of this, I never demanded the food allotted to the governor because the demands were heavy on the people. Remember me with favor, my God, for all I have done for these people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 15. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave us as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people, and they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the loving love that we kindled in you, see that you also excel this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our, your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And there is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work, so that your eager willingness to do so may be matched by your completion of it, according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered so much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel is written in the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 6, beginning at verse 20. Looking at his disciples, Jesus said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and live for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. 
But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated their prophets. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. As we turn to your word to reflect on it, we pray that you will speak to us afresh. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we continue with the study of the book of Nehemiah, today we turn to chapter 5. Chapter 4 ended on a good note with the Jews going ahead with the work of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Despite the opposition from the enemies that surrounded Judah from all sides, they worked with one hand while holding a weapon in the other. As we saw last week, Satan whose name means adversary is committed to opposing God's work 
to God and His people, and especially when they worked zealously for God's glory. And when he failed in his attacks from the outside, Satan now begins an attack from within. Two of the favorite weapons of Satan are greed and selfishness. If we begin to think only about ourselves and what we want, we'll be playing into the hands of the enemy. When I am selfish and greedy, I will put myself at the center of everything and insist on getting what I want when I want it. Often that would mean taking advantage of others or exploiting others for our selfish goals. Raymond Brown points out that in each of these chapters that we look at, Nehemiah faces a different problem. In chapter 1, he faces a personal problem. He is disturbed and saddened when he receives the news of the terrible state of affairs in Judah. And he sensed that he had to do something about that situation. In chapter 2, there is a political problem. How can Nehemiah, who was a high-ranking official in the palace at Susa, convince the Persian king to permit him to go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem that had the reputation of being a rebellious city. In chapter 3, we see the administrative problem of having to rebuild the walls from the ruins. And on top of that, some of the people were unwilling to cooperate in this project. Chapter 4, deals with the physical problem of the imminent attack by the enemies and the psychological problem of discouragement within the ranks. In chapter 5, which is a text before us today, there is a serious economic and social problem. As he dealt with the other problems in the previous chapters, Nehemiah had to deal with his new problem. If the work is to be completed. Verse 1. Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. There was an internal strife. You see the enemy could not stop the work of God by direct attack, by an attack from the outside. But now the conflict within the community was threatening to disrupt this work. When one group of people raise a great outcry against another set of people, how can the work progress? When there are unresolved issues, a lack of unity, when there is infighting, they will ne neither be fighting the real enemy nor getting God's work done. Now, what were the reasons for the strife among the people of God? Verse 2, some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. In chapter 3, we saw how people from different walks of life join their hands in rebuilding the city walls. In order to undertake this work, Many of them had to leave behind their, leave their regular trades and professions, farms and land holdings for a period of about two months. So they couldn't provide for the needs of their household. Verse 3, others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards and our homes to get grain during the famine. So another problem was that there was a famine. There was a shortage of food supply. And the greedy merchants used the opportunity to inflate the price of grain. And it became so expensive that some had to mortgage the property to be able to provide food for their family. Verse 4, still others were saying, we have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. 
the Persian kings taxes on fields and vineyards were increased in order to meet the rising expenditure of the empire which included constructing impressive palaces and the cause of undertaking military campaigns to make matters worse having now mortgaged their fields some of the families were in such dire straits that they were compelled to sell some of their family members into slavery look at verse 5 although we are of the same flesh and blood as our fellow Jews and though our children are as good as theirs yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery some of our daughters have already been enslaved but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others as we can see later in verse 11 the rich were taking advantage of the crisis to make money of the poor charging them interest a practice that was condemned in the law of Moses the Mosaic law clear, clearly prohibited the charging of interest on loans given to fellow Israelites and this was in fact one of the reasons that it resulted in the people being taken into exile and a century later they were repeating the same offense as I mentioned at the beginning one of the favorite references of Satan the adversary is selfishness so let us allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts and minds to see if there is any selfishness or greed in us is the love of money shaping or dictating our relationships is our attitude towards money preventing us from working in unity for the glory of God How did Nehemiah handle this crisis? Verse 6 When I heard the cry and these charges, I was very angry. Nehemiah became angry because the problems were caused in part because of the greed of, of those who wanted to make profit of the desperate situation of others. This was something the law of Moses clearly said it was wrong. It is written in Exodus chapter 22 verse 25 if you lend money to one of my people among you who is needy do not treat it like a business deal charge no interest now interestingly there is no mention about the work on the walls of the city in this chapter possibly the work was interrupted and it must have frustrated Nehemiah that they could stand strongly against the enemies from the outside but would fall so quickly to these kind of problems within. Verse 7 Nehemiah writes, I pondered them in my mind. Though he was angry because of his passion for the work that he had undertaken Nehemiah was wise enough to not act, to act until he had considered the matter carefully this is, this is not new but this is an important lesson for us that we may be right in getting angry in certain situations there is, there may be a, there is a place for righteous anger and even then it is important for us to pause to consider the matter quietly and carefully before we do something about it what we see then is that Nehemiah confronted the nobles and the rulers he told the truth and from the results that we can see in verses 12 and 13 we can assume that he had told the truth in love 
verses 7 and 8 I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials I told them you are charging your own people interest so I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said as far well as possible we have bought back our fellow Jews who were sold to the Gentiles now you are selling your own people only for them to be sold back to us they kept quietly because they could find nothing to say so one of the things of course we notice that one of the best ways to deal with a situation like this is to confront directly and Nehemiah note, notes here that when Judah was conquered many Jews were sold as slaves to foreigners and many of them had been bought back bought out of slavery by their fellow Jews but now the Jews were being sold into slavery to other Jews because they couldn't pay off high interest loans this was terribly wrong verse 9 so I continued what are you what you're doing is not right shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God uh, to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies this is where we also go wrong when it comes to financial dealings there is no fear of God there is no regard for God's will and wisdom the only concern is how much money can we make out of the deal I believe individuals and churches must be governed by the fear of God in all matters and particularly when it comes to money verses 10 and 11 I and my brothers and my men are also lending money and grain but let us stop charging in dress give back to them immediately their fields vineyards olive groves and houses and also the interest you are charging them one percentage of the money grain new wine and olive oil Nehemiah's intention was not that the nobles and the rulers would just regret what they're doing or just stop what they're doing but they had to set right what they had done wrong if money had been charged unfairly or collateral was taken unfairly it had to be set right here we may be reminded of Zacchaeus when he was convicted of of his sins as he was as he as he had this encounter with Jesus he wanted to set things right he gave back four times as per the law all that he had cheated others and he went beyond his call of duty to sell half of all that to give to the poor when we look at verses 12 and 13 we see that the nobles and rulers responded well to Nehemiah's rebuke Nehemiah had told the truth in love were confronting these people but they responded well by admitting that they were wrong and were willing to take the corrective steps as Nehemiah had suggested and this spirit of teachability and correction is impressive because often we are unwilling to admit when we are wrong unwilling to take corrective steps especially if money is involved we can come up with very convenient excuses verse 12 the first part then I summoned the priests and made the nobles and officials take an oath to do what they had promised Nehemiah didn't go what he didn't want to go by just the mere word of the nobles and rulers he wanted to ensure that there will be an accountability in this matter and I think accountability is what is missing when it comes to many individuals and organizations including Christian organizations when it comes to money in verses 14 to 16 we see Nehemiah's good example 
Nehemiah was a great example of putting the work of God ahead of his own personal interests. He, the, the text tells us that he certainly had the right to tax the people for his support. Others, the governors before him had done it. But he didn't take that right because it won't help the work of God. We find the same attitude with Apostle Paul who had the right to be supported but didn't take the right because it was better that way for the gospel of Christ as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 15, the earlier governors, those preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to food and wine. Their assistants also loaded it over the people. But listen to this, Nehemiah says, but, of, but out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. Nehemiah did what was right before God, not what was right for his own cares and concerns and interests because he knew ultimately he is accountable and answerable to God and in verses 17 and 18 as we move forward we have the example of Nehemiah's generosity Nehemiah not only did not take what he could have taken he also gave what he didn't have to give he received a lot of food from the king's provisions which he could have sold for his own profit. Instead, he gave them away as an example of generosity, feeding as many as 150 people regularly. Nehemiah, in his own life, lived the way he told the nobles and rulers to live, to not take personal advantage of others' needs. He did what a godly person and particularly a godly leader must do. He never expected more of his followers than he expected of himself. We come to the last verse, verse 19. Remember me with favor, my God, for all I have done for this people. Some commentators say he was wrong in saying this, that he was looking for praise of men but I think in his prayer Nehemiah was not looking for praise from men and women but from God there is a place in our private conversation with God where we can confidently when we are confident that we have walked uprightly we can say that we can be honest before God in fact Nehemiah probably originally intended that no one else would see all or even part of this book because he had written all of this in his diary this was his entries in his personal diary David Guzik says we should be glad that God took this personal diary of Nehemiah and gave it to us because it shows us that a leader must first lead by example and that Nehemiah could tell others to do what was right here because his walk was right. His public words and private actions said the same thing. What a challenge before us to walk the talk, to live what we preach beginning from home. So as we look at this, as we look to this chapter, we, are gleaned, we have gleaned valuable lessons for our lives about our, how important our attitude toward money is. It can impact all of our relationships. That we should be selfless for the sake of others and for the sake of God's work. And one of the ways to be selfless is to give. That is how we become more and more selfless. May God help us. Amen. We take this time to pray for the sick and the elderly. I'm sad to announce that Mrs. Nancy Razan, our member, passed away on Sunday, 19th September. She was 87. Mr. Ruben Jagdane, our member, passed away on Thursday, 
23rd of September. He was 76. We pray for God's comfort upon the bereaved families. We also pray for those who are unwell, especially those who are undergoing treatment for cancer and for the elderly among us, especially Pragash Naik, Olga Nazareth, Lulu Thomas, Lizzie Korean, Patmini Abraham, Joyce Nichols, Vijay Rajaratnam, Sunita Vijay Pradap, Shalini Dongre, Bishop Joshua, Pushpa Bengra, and Suvir Shondroy. Let's pray. Our gracious Lord, as we call on your name to pray for those who are in need, those who are grieving, those who are unwell, those who are elderly and have the limitations because of the advanced age. We approach with confidence knowing that you are a God who is compassionate to those who are in need, those who are in trouble, those who are lowly, and a God who comes to their aid, to their aid. We pray that you would mercifully, Lord, uh, by your presence and your word, comfort the grieving families of Mrs. Nancy Resdan and Mr. Ruben Jagdane. And we pray for your healing touch upon all those who are undergoing treatment. And we pray that you continue to strengthen those who are weak, those who are homebound. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We will now pray for those who will be celebrating the birthdays and wedding anniversaries during this week. Birthdays, Nalini Rao, Nihal Alfred, Rajesh Salins, Jodiga Ghosh, Ruben Ellis, Miriam Aib Joseph, Siddharth Puli, Ruba Samuel, Mark Mathai, Niola Matthew, Jeremy John, Erin Matthew, Johan Jem Sadkar, Annama Jayachandra, Ashish Masi, and Vijaya Rajaratnam. Wedding anniversaries, Bindu and Kristam Bodra, Sheba and Captain Vivek Pavmani, Olga and Ashley Nazareth, Yvonne and Jekuma Joshua, Deba and Dilip Lewis. Let's pray. We bless your name, Lord, for the wonderful ways in which you have led those who are celebrating the birthdays and wedding anniversary this week. How you have sustained them, especially during the past year. Oh Lord, we seek your blessings upon them. That you continue to be the Lord of their lives. That as they seek your face, that you would direct their lives. So that they will always remain at the center of your will. That they may lead lives that are joyful and purposeful. Strengthen them in every way to walk in your ways. Bless them and their families. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We continue to intercede and we use a prayer of intercession from the book of worship. When I say, Lord, in your mercy, your response would be, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for justice and peace in the whole world and for fullness of life for everyone. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who live in this city, for the removal of all that divides us from each other and for true harmony in our country. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all engaged in agriculture, industry and commerce, for all workers skilled and unskilled and for all those who defend our country. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For teachers and students, scientists, artists and writers and for all who influence the minds and hearts of others lord in your mercy hear our prayer for those who are suffering the poor and hungry the destitute and oppressed the unemployed the sick and the dying 
for all who have them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all to whom authority is entrusted in this and other countries, and especially for our president, the prime minister, and the governor and chief minister of Maharashtra, and for all who have power over other people, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the unity of all Christian people and for, with, for the witness and service in the world, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For your whole, whole church in our country, for its councils and leaders, especially for our moderator, the moderator of the Church of South India and the Metropolitan of the Mahatma Church, for our bishop and for all other ministers of your church, that they may be faithful in their ministry. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. That with all your people who have faithfully served you in this life, we also may share in the eternal joy of your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hazen, Heavenly Father, the coming of your kingdom, and grant these petitions which you offer in the name of your Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Confession of Sin Beloved our Lord Jesus Christ said, The Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than this. God so loved the world that he gave his only son Jesus Christ to save us from our sins, to be an advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us therefore confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved by God's grace to keep his commandments and to live in love and peace with all people. We say together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against one another in thought and word and deed, in the evil we have done and in the good we have not done, through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who forgive one another and truly repent of their sins, have mercy on us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness. And keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Announcement. I have just one announcement. The annual general meeting of St. Stephen's Church will be held at 11 a.m. today. The Zoom link for the meeting was sent by email to the members on Friday. All the members of the church are requested to attend the AGM.
that spray almighty god we thank you for the word that has come to us today oh lord we pray that you enable us that our lives would not would not be driven by selfishness and greed we confess that many a times selfishness determines our motives and even our relationships our building is of relationships lord we confess that our selfishness has often led to conflicts and disunity among us O oh Lord we pray that you help us to primarily think of what would bring glory and honor to you Lord when we see evil around us and within us as a community we pray that you'd enable us to have the kind of anger that Nehemiah had when he heard all that was happening among the people and yet enable us to carefully and silently consider everything before we say anything or before we act on it o oh lord we pray that you'd enable us that our thoughts and words and actions would be governed by our reverence for you lord the holy one help us to be generous like nehemiah was selfless like he was not wanting to burden the people any further refusing to tax them and sharing whatever resources he had for the benefit of a larger community we pray that you we would enable us to have that kind of a spirit within us o oh lord we pray that we would in all situations particularly as we face different challenges as nehemiah did as we read in as we have seen in in the five different chapters we had looked at five different problems and yet every time he approached you in prayer seeking your direction seeking your wisdom we pray that in our own lives you would enable us to likewise seek your face in every situation and to seek to honor you and act out of reverence for you lord and we come in our eyes and all our dear ones as we begin this new week and we pray that you can you to shape our lives direct our ways that everything may go well with us and so that your name be glorified in christ name we pray amen we say the lord's prayer together Our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever amen let's receive the blessing the peace of god which surpasses all human understanding keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of god and of his son jesus christ our lord and the blessing of god almighty the father the son and the holy spirit be among us and remain with us always amen